did manage to put out some noise there and sounded pretty joyful. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. God is so good. Well, some messages you have 40 hours to prepare and some you have 40 minutes. So today was one of those 40 minute days. So um, let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you are a living God, and that your Spirit is here with us today. And thank you, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts to hear your word, Father, and to take heed to your word. And we thank you for your faithfulness to provide your word. We love you, Lord, with all of our hearts, and we thank you for loving us and sending Jesus Christ. to die, to pour out his blood for us. And it's because you first loved us, Father, that we return our love to you. For without your love in our hearts, we could not love. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's a mess out there. There's ice. There's a little snow. The trees are weighted down. And the trees being weighted down test their strength. Some of them, the branches break. Some of them get uprooted. Some of them stand strong, and they're firm, immovable, they're stable. They've dug down, they have a root that endures. God is faithful to cause us to stand. You know, some trees can be rotten on the inside. Some people are that way. You don't see it, they can look good on the outside. I mean, the tree looks perfect. But let it get under a little stress. A storm. And it breaks. And then you see the rottenness inside. It's always exposed. In the end. So how stable are we? Brother John mentioned last week. Let's look at Ephesians 4. How that's the purpose of the church. Ephesians 4, talking about the gifts that God has given to the church. Gifts of ministry. So the purpose is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ, till we all each and every individual, all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The knowledge of the Son of God is to build us strong. It's to cause our faith to be strong. It's to cause us to be able to stand in the storms and not be tossed unto a perfect man. Does that mean sinless? No, it does not. It means mature man. Somebody who's able to face the storms and to know how to deal with them. Somebody who sits next to a brother or sister they might have a problem with. Or that they see an error in their life. And rather than jumping on them and saying, You're faith, you shouldn't talk like that. 
I didn't really care when I asked you how you were doing. You didn't have to really tell me because I didn't really care. I was trying to make conversation. Is that the attitude we should have towards our brothers and our sisters? Shouldn't we be able to be honest and say that it's okay to not be okay? Shouldn't we be able to minister to our brothers and sisters who are struggling? How else will we ever become stable to stand against the storms of life? If there is rottenness and cankeredness on our inside, do we not want to flush it out? Do we not want it to be exposed before it tears down the tree? Don't we want to be stable? Don't we want to stand strong? I think we should as a church. I think we should all want to come into the unity of the faith. And my belief is that these small group meetings, that's one of our goals, is to cause us to be able to be more unified as a church, to be more unified in the faith, in our relationship with Jesus Christ and with one another. Because we're all members, one of another, in particular. We are the body of Christ. We're not just a building. We have a beautiful building here and God has blessed us with it and it's paid for and we're thankful for that. But more importantly, we should be a beautiful people. The world should know us by our love. They should know that that church, they might have their problems, but they work them out. They love each other. They'll do anything for one another. There are people that no longer come here that know, that can't deny that we have shown them love. We've shown them love in our care. We've shown them love with finances. They will never be able to deny that. They can say what they want about us, but they can never deep inside not know that we care deeply. Stability. Strength. You see those big oak trees. They're huge. You can't get your arms even a third of the way around them. They've stood strong for centuries. Their roots go deep. Their roots go out. They spread far and wide. They're anchored. Their soul is anchored. Is your soul anchored this morning? Are you anchored to Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And the title of our message is An Abiding Hope. Because that's what we have. We have an abiding hope. Let's look at Psalms 1. And verse 3. This is what I believe each of every individual who knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is what you should want for your life. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Don't you want to be prosperous? I believe you do. That's the way to get there is to be stable. To be like a rock. To be immovable. To be secure upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Jeremiah. This is actually our text. Jeremiah chapter 17. And verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out of roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. 
And then verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. A tree planted by the river. Let's look at John chapter 15. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now we are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. (coughs) I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. And without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them in the fire and they're burned. There are a lot of branches laying around out there this morning because they were weak. They turned loose of the tree. It's nature's way of pruning, of rooting out the weak. That's what trials are in our life. It's God's way of pruning and rooting out the weak. (coughs) Excuse me. We want to be like that tree that's planted by the water that brings forth in fruit and season. A big oak tree, a firm, stable oak tree takes years and years and years to grow. Moses was on the backside of the desert for 40 years preparing. Full maturity does not come overnight. Be encouraged in that, saints, that full maturity doesn't come overnight. When you fall, get back up. Keep pushing on. A just man falls seven times, but he gets back up. That's the key. He gets back up. Peter walked on the water. He went down. He cried out to Jesus, save me. And immediately he reached down and picked him up. If you fall and you cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I've done it again. Forgive me. Please. He's faithful. He's just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You can't do it on your own. You need Jesus Christ in your Lord, in your life to save you, to change you. Does not faith (coughs) isn't it the substance the very substance of the things you hope for. You hope for the image of Christ to be formed in you. Are you believing for that? Then hold on to it. Pile up the evidence that he's given you in his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Oh boy, just got a bunch of different notes messed up here. Um, he's, He's faithful and he's just to forgive your sins. That's one of the things that he said in his word that should build your faith when you fall and know that you can get back up and he'll receive you. Does that give you rights to sin? No. You have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to draw near to him. Let's look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 11. And we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful, but followers of those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. 
Let's look at Hebrews 10. And now I'm not going where you think I'm going. I might go near there, but I won't. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart. A true heart. One without guile. A true heart. A heart that desires the Lord with all your heart. To want to change. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that is promised. What has he promised? He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised to justify you. Hebrews 10.35 Cast not therefore away your confidence which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise. For yet a little while and he shall come he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. For we are not of those that draw back unto perdition, but of those that believe to the saving of the soul. Don't draw back. Any man having put his hands to the plow and draws back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Keep pressing. Press on. Go past the hurts. If your feelings have been hurt, Move past it. Forgive. Say I've forgiven them 60 times. Well, Jesus said 70 times 7. You got to keep forgiving. And when you hit that 490th time, does that mean you quit? No, press on. Press on past it. You bring your gift to the altar and you realize that your brother's got ought against you. Go to him. Get it straight. Let's start functioning like the church of God should function. If we're faithful to the things that he asks of us, the simple things, that is an expression of our faith. And then the other things will come. The things that we want, the prosperity, the healing, the change, those things will come as we're faithful. In the little things. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to what we know to do. And sometimes it's just the simple things. Like. You which are spiritual. And make sure you're spiritual. Not because you think so. But because people recognize you as that. Okay. Let another man praise thee. Not thine own self. Because a lot of times people think themselves more highly than they ought to think themselves. She which are spiritual, see such a one overtaken in fault. Go to him in a spirit of humility, considering your own self, lest you be overtaken in that same fault or something worse. Go to him, not with the intention of making them so that you can endure them better. Go to them with the intention of strengthening them in their spiritual walk with the Savior Jesus Christ. That should be our motive with everybody. That we should all want our brothers and sisters to be strengthened in the Lord. So that we can stand firm in that storm. James 4. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God. What's he going to do? He's going to draw near to you. You take the first step. He'll take the next six. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord 
and he will lift you up. Are we more grieved? Are we more concerned of our own sins than we are of the sins of the brother or sister beside us? We should be. Our own sins should be the one that, ones that grieve us the most. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, really no, you're not. His life is between him and the Lord. Does that mean I shouldn't be concerned? No, it doesn't. But it, it's you that you need to be the most concerned for when it comes to your relationship with the Father. Examine yourself, lest you be overtaken in a fault. Let's look at Psalms 139. The familiar scripture. Psalms 139. Verse 17. How precious are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. And more importantly, he's still with you. Surely you will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them with my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in your ways everlasting. How stable are we? Let's look at Matthew 13. Beginning in verse 18. How ye there, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not. Then comes the wicked one, and catches away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and immediately with joy he receives it. Yet he has no root in himself, but he endures for a while, and when the ice and the wind and the snow come or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. He also that received a seed among the thorns and hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, they choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word, understands it, which also, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. But they all bring forth fruit. We're not all going to produce the same quality of fruit. We're not all going to produce necessarily the same quantity of fruit. But we should all be producing fruit. Therefore, judge not your brother, lest you be judged. Somebody said, well, it's actually in a movie that's come out. It's a Christian movie produced by Focus on the family. And one of the lines in there is, why are Christians always so judgy? And, you know, we are to judge a righteous judgment. 
And we are to discern, to be discerning. But you can make, I can't make, an eternal judgment upon any man's life. It's the word of God that will judge him, not the word that you see, but it's the word of God that has settled into their heart, that they become aware of, that they have knowledge of, that they will stand before the judgment seat of God and Jesus Christ, the word, will be right there and he will judge. It is not up to us to make an eternal judgment upon any man's life. So, don't ever ask me again, are they saved? I can tell you what their fruit is in their life and what my opinion is, but I can't tell you if another man's going to heaven or going to hell just based upon what I see. Because I serve a merciful God. He is the one that makes the final judgment in a man's life. I can't. I can give you my opinion. I can offer you what the word says. But in the end, I cannot make that judgment. If you can, more power to you. But realize this with what judgment you judge, you too shall be judged. So take heed. Take heed. <coughs> no root. The man that had no root, he was unstable. And the storm came. And he was plucked up fell across the highway blocking the way for others. Don't be a stumbling block in another man's life. Some were broken off. We read in John 15 branches that were broken off. Sometimes a large branch can fall And kill an innocent. God's sovereign. Understand that. But sometimes. Christian. Can fall. Be broken off. And kill an innocent. For example. How many people threw away their faith when people like Jimmy Swagger, um, Tammy Faye, and what's the guy's name? James, yeah, Baker. How many people's faith went out the window because these great names fell? It was because their confidence wasn't in Jesus Christ their confidence and their faith was based on somebody else's faith. Don't allow your faith to be based upon anything or anybody except the clear word of God. Because it will stand through all eternity. It will stand forever and forever. And you can put your confidence and your trust and the God of this universe, who spoke all things into existence, all things into existence. It wasn't that he took matter and made something. He took what wasn't and made it to be by his spoken word. His exercise of faith created the universe and all things therein. That is a magnanimous of our God. Let's look at James once again. James chapter 1 and verse 6. Let's start in verse 5. But if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. 
and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He's here today, he's here tomorrow. Which way should I go? Uh, the world's looking pretty good over there. God's looking pretty good over here. I just don't know. I'm having fun over here. This seems a little strict over here. He's tossed constantly. There are people who've left this church because of instability. They were never stable. Something was always shaking their keel. They were rocking with the waves. Never firm and stable. Had their eye on something else other than God. Had their eye on whatever. A person. Something other than Jesus Christ. Because when you keep your eye upon Jesus Christ and you're blinded to the circumstances around you, unlike Peter, you won't go down. You continue to walk into the loving arms of Jesus Christ. Stability. Psalm 73 shows us a man who was unstable until Asaph was lamenting about the prosperity of the wicked and how they die without pain and how things seem so well for them. They live in nice houses. They eat good food. Drive nice cars. And it was all too painful when he thought about it. It just caused pain and anguish in his life. Just like it does in us when we start envying what the world has. We started envying the fact that they stayed home and watched a game or watched a race or whatever, but we had to come to church. Now, you didn't have to come to church. I hope you came because you love the Lord with all your heart and you wanted to be here with the other saints. For no other reason, that's the reason to come. And if you didn't come, don't be condemned because I don't mean, I do not mean that. It was all too painful for him until he went into the sanctuary of God. Until he came to church, all this just seemed wrong. That the wicked would be prospering and that the Christian would be suffering. But then he understood their end. Their end is instability. Their end is in verse 18. Surely you did set them in slippery places. You cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. I am abiding. You have holden me by my right hand. You didn't let me go under. You've held me close. You've kept me attached to the vine. And as long as you're attached to the vine, there is life. There is life. Let's look at Hebrews 6. Let's 
start in verse 14. Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for com confirmation is to those an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, two unchanging facts, in which it was impossible, for one, for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope, our hope in Jesus Christ, which hope we have, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that wherein the veil, within the veil, whether the forerunner for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You remember when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent the veil into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest was allowed to go into there. Jesus Christ has given us entrance into that veil. He's brought us into the Holy of Holies to be with the God of the universe and to commune with him and to have right standing with him to be cleansed and purified of all unrighteousness. What can give you any more stability than that? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life an abiding hope this is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto all men amen an abiding hope an anchor to the soul Let's look at James chapter 1 verse 21 Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness receive with meekness this engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word not just hearers. For if you're just a hearer of the word if you only hear it Go out of here and allow it to just be another word spoken. You'll be in deception. You'll think everything's okay. But you'll have that rottenness of soul when the storm comes. You won't have those stable roots that go out, that are spread out. And the branches that are strong and will hold up in the winds and the rain and the ice and the snow but you'll snap off like that weak tree that came down across the highway blocking the road to others. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a stumbling block to the world. Don't be a stumbling block to your fellow brothers and sisters. We have a better hope. Let's look at Hebrews Seven. Hebrews 7 verse 19 for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw near to God we draw near to God he draws near to us that better hope 
is Jesus Christ. Salvation through his blood. I made mention of this earlier. Don't believe it because I say it. Believe it because you see it in order. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, <coughs> whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be Catholics or Baptists, whether we be bound or free, and have been all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. <coughs> we are members, one of another. That gives the church stability. Let's look again at Psalms 139. I read it earlier, but it bears reading again. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me. Lead me. By your Holy Spirit, lead each and every one of us. In the way everlasting. 1 Corinthians 26. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 11. There aren't 26 chapters of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We oftentimes read this at communion. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, he did show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, and that we should not be condemned with the world. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4. Though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards us. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. <coughs> but I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear prude, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. 
Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given me to edification and not to destruction. Matthew 10, 22, He that endures to the end shall be saved. Father, I thank you for this word and thank you for planting it deep within our hearts. Cause us to be a stable people. Not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Not confused. But Father, let there be a sure sound to the trumpet. Let there be a sound of warning. Let there be a sound of joy. Let your word